Um, I'd, I'd first like to start, <coughs> of course, I'm getting a tickle in my throat as I start to speak, which of course is just the perfect timing. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'd like to start with how I first even discovered this group of women that I work on. And it really starts with, uh, I know Mary Ellen doesn't like to be congratulated too much, but I really consider her work foundational. And um, it really started with my discovery of her book. <coughs> Excuse me. At the time, I was a um, teaching assistant for a professor from England uh, who didn't have very um, feminist-friendly views, let's say. Uh, he once said uh, that just demonstrates how poultry is feminism, doesn't it? And I thought, oh boy, this is going to be interesting. But one day he said to me, you know, there's a book in the library, and it's blue, and it's on the shelf just there. Could you go get it for me? And he said, it's about women in philosophy. And I thought, women in philosophy? Wow. I, I was very surprised because, of course, we're used to the patriarchal tradition where we only hear about, or I should say masculinist maybe, we only hear about the males in philosophy, and we call it philosophy. So I dutifully went and found the blue book on the shelf just there after a few minutes of searching, and that's when I discovered Mary Ellen's four-volume series on women in the history of philosophy. And I was just elated. I really, there's no other way to talk about it than to say elated because I really didn't know or think that there were women in the tradition at all. So then as my interest continued to develop while I'm in my doctoral program, I um, wanted to explore women's views of the public-private distinction. I don't know how familiar you are with that distinction in American thought, we talk about it quite frequently. And um, <clears throat> it really is the idea that women belong in the realm of home, family, children, child care, nurturing, and men belong in the world of business, economics, commerce, public life. Uh, it grows out of, you know, we, we have philosophers, famous quotes. I don't know if you've heard some of my favorites when Kant said, an educated woman may as well have a beard. Uh, and, uh, and Hegel said, women um, can think some higher level thinking, but they can't do serious, abstract, conceptual thinking because uh, they're just too... Um, capricious, and they certainly can't be in politics because of that. They're too arbitrary and capricious. So I wanted to look at what do women think about that public-private distinction, and especially what do women in the 19th century think about it, because that's when they believed in the public-private distinction. So I started exploring that, and the two lessons I learned after discovering Mary Ellen's book is that if you want to find women, uh, you have to go through men. And um, as I talked to this uh, about this with my advisor, who's very, all my man, all my advisors in my degree were men, and very feminist friendly. And as I talked about the public private distinction, he said, Well, you really need women who read Hegel to do this right. And we both thought, Yeah, right, like we're going to find women who read Hegel. But he did remember that there was a book about this weird little group in St. Louis, Missouri in the 1860s. Uh, and St. Louis, Missouri at that time was a booming metropolis because it was on the Mississippi River, very central location in the U.S. at the time. They talked about moving the U.S. capital there at one point. And he gave me the book in my mailbox with a little card uh, inserted at the page, on page, I think it was page 256, and he wrote bingo. And we, I was like, there, I've got it, I'm on my way. Once I started looking into the women, they were primarily within education. I was very disappointed about that. So I went back to him and said, what do I do? They're not philosophers. And he said, what do you mean? Philosophy of education has always been a branch of the field. So there were women. They, they were in education because that's what women could do. And so I started going with it. And it was very um, enlightening and inspiring. And I had a friend at the time who said, don't do women in philosophy. You'll get ghettoized, right? I've done women in philosophy, and sometimes it's almost intellectual history, but I'm very happy with it, and I'm very happy to bring their works to light. So uh, those are kind of the preliminaries. <clears throat> the going through men part is very important. For any of you who are interested in some area that you haven't seen women in, go to one of the men that you respect and admire the most in their work, whether it's 17th century or yesterday, and uh, see if they had correspondence with women. <clears throat> 
you, it's amazing what you'll find. You can't find archival work by the women, but you can find it in men's collections. And uh, it's very interesting. Thomas Davidson, for instance, uh, he's, he was more in literature and philosophy in the 19th century in the US, corresponded with dozens of women. And that's where I found one great quote where a woman says, I know what you're saying and thinking right now, audacious woman, you're doing philosophy, right? So, so it's very, uh, that's, that's how you do it. That's one way if you are interested and can't find what you're looking for, think about going about it that way. Um, I'm gonna use my own machine here as we go. Okay, so <clears throat> make sure this really does work. Oh, it does, I love that. Okay, so, <clears throat> Of course, I clicked the wrong thing on my own machine. Okay, so there, I want to do some stage setting first. So the early uh, 19th century, we actually had, in the late, 19, late, late 18th century, we actually had some ground foundation building, right? And I like to call these the literary ladies. So the literary ladies were mostly novelists and poets who would write essays or sometimes a couple of books about um, comportment, moral education, um, women's proper role. One of my favorites was uh, Catherine Maria Sedgwick writing about the joy of sweeping. If only young ladies can learn the joy of sweeping and feel fulfilled in house care, home care uh, and housework, they'll be so much happier. And, and actually, Catherine Maria Sedgwick was fairly progressive. Uh, she did talk about uh, women's uh, marital relationships in ways that were progressive, but she was a woman of her time and she knew that most women and girls were going to be in the home doing home care and she wanted to inspire them that, that, that you know, think about the joys of sweeping. I think she actually used that phrase. Um, and there are other women in this period like Sarah Josepha Hale who over and over and over again said women should remain in the home women are best at caring for children, women are naturally meant to do child care, etc. But she also was a professional woman who was the first woman to edit a periodical uh, in the English-speaking world, as far as I know. And uh, it was a ladies' magazine. She would write editorials in the back. And sometimes she would write under the name of a doctor or a professor, you know, a, a fictional character, to validate what she's saying, to demonstrate, yes, ladies, you need to do this or that or the other thing to make sure that you're, you're taking care of your children right, etc. Um, she insisted that women should be educated for maternal or domestic roles, right? Very much, I don't know if you're familiar with Catherine Beecher, who Mary Ellen will be working on this week too, um, but very much in that school of thought that women are really best if they can, be, they can realize selfhood in and through their work in the home. So she said, in a professional world, if they needed to work, they could be teachers, they could be nurses, they could be doctors, missionaries, not ministers, because ministers would be leading and having um, authority over men in a congregation. In, in Germany, um, Catholicism is fairly prominent, but in US and Protestant circles, we've had women ordained as ministers since the 1860s. Not in droves, but it started in the 1860s, so we're used to thinking of women as ministers. Um, so Sarah Hill was also from the Protestant tradition, and she, she said, oh yes, be missionaries, but not ministers. That would be having authority over men, that's not good. Of course, women could go to you know, far-flung places like Africa and India and China, where they have no idea what they expect at the other end of their trip, but they couldn't be in leadership over a congregation in the suburbs, but that's another fun um, contradiction in a sense. Um, but the other thing these literary ladies did is they promoted women's history. And that actually is a very significant step. Sarah Hale, again, is one of my favorites. And she wrote a book of women's history, starting with Eve. Right? She didn't think about the fact that Eve might be mythical. Um, she treated her as a historical character. And she would valorize all of those feminine qualities in them, even when she did a profile on Margaret Fuller, who was very, very, uh, as Anna Brackett later said, masculine in her mindset. She was very well-educated, like a young man would have been. <clears throat> and she really was unapologetic about her feminism. But Sarah Hale cast her as a very diminutive kind of character, very interesting. But that is a real service, because they set a foundation of expecting to think about women in history, 
and to explore that history and to revere that history and carry it on. Um, then the other group we have are educators, spiritualists, and activists. I'm actually revising the work that Julia referred to. And one of the things that they said to me was, if you're going to revise this work, you're calling it American. This is an English uh, publisher. They said, remember, American is not the, only the US. So uh, let's either expand it to North American or call it US, right? So as I looked at the um, women educators, oh, the other thing they said is don't do only white women because America is a diverse country, right? The US is a diverse country. So I've been trying to expand looking at Canadian women and Mexican women because that's North America, if you ask me, um, and also to look at women of color in America. That's usually how we refer to our, our ethnic groups in combination, and I know the language for that varies country to country. That's a respectful term. I hope it sounds respectful to you. So I've been looking to include women of color, and in order to do that, I have to move more to religion because there are certain areas of authority that women had in the 19th century, motherhood, education, and religion. So in the African-American community, a lot of times they did not have a good education, but they had the spirit. And I don't know if you've ever seen any kind of account of African-American religion um, in the US, but it's very, very expressive. And it also is very much infused with the sense of the spiritual nature of your understanding is more important than an intellectual nature. So they didn't have to be literate. They could hear the Bible stories, hear the gospel songs, and they could go preach. And, and a lot of African-American services will go for hours. I'm used to the nice Protestant service where you sit for one hour and then you go home. <laughs> but um, in African-American tradition, it's very different. So I've included in, in the other category in the early decades of the 19th century, educators, of course, because that was a realm open to women, uh, spiritualists and activists. Okay, so we had people, um, we had the teachers and lecturers who, again, were carrying on that tradition of Sarah Hale and um, looking at how women should be educated. And usually it was for motherhood or motherhood-like professions. Um, sometimes uh, some authors have called it professionalizing motherhood. Uh, um, Susan Elizabeth Blow, who's one of the women I worked on, actually referred to her own early childhood education as spiritual motherhood. She was a single woman who uh, was never married because her father uh, disapproved of the man she wanted to marry because he wasn't high class enough. She never married and she went into early childhood ed and called it her spiritual motherhood. Okay, so for this group, education was a means to women's progress and moral reform for some of them, not all, was a religious mandate. Okay, so they, they had two reasons to enter the public realm to break out of the home because they could be educators or they could be moral reformers because they had this inner moral, spiritual understanding of the world that validated them in this public realm, right? So they're taking those private virtues of the home and exporting them into the public and making the public place a better place, in theory, through moral reform. And then um, the issues that they dealt with at the time were women's rights. Uh, sometimes it was a very mild version in those early decades because women couldn't even lecture in public without being considered um, inappropriate and violating the boundaries. And sometimes it got more progressive toward the 1830s into the 40s. Um, and then the abolition of slavery. One couple of people who worked on both were Sarah Grimke and her sister Angelina Grimke. And that's G-R-I, let me write it here. I'll do it new. okay. So Sarah, because it's an unusual spelling, Sarah and Angelina, they were sisters, Angelina Grimke. Um, oh, you can't see that. Only I can see that. I'm sorry. G-R-I-M-K-E. I forgot that I don't have the contemporaneous PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, they started talking about slavery as a big, big moral sin. But because they were women, they were told they couldn't lecture in public. So they combined their abolition lectures and their validation of their role as women to engage in those lectures and to be uh, authorities in that way, have moral authority. Okay, um, now the next slide. Huh? Oh, dear. There we go. Okay. So then we had expanding, a period of expanding starting in the 1840s on. 
So the work that the first groups of women did, the literary ladies and the educators and spiritualists and activists, opened up a new world of possibility for women. They could, of course, be in education. They could be literature, um, you know, novelists or essayists, and, uh, or also engage in journalism. There were some early journalists in the 19, 1850s and 60s. Uh, they could get into nursing and medicine. They could get into religion. Some women started getting ordained. They could do philanthropy or community work. Toward the end of the 19th century in the US, 1880s and 90s, uh, the women's club movement was huge. Uh, they had huge women cl women's clubs in Chicago and New York and Boston. And for instance, Lucy Ames Mead would lecture to 200 people on uh, philosophy, plain old philosophy, or literature, or peace theory. And women really had a lot of power in these realms. It was a very upper class movement, and I'm a poor working farm girl. Um, I, I, you know, people don't really believe me when I say that, but we literally did not have indoor plumbing until I was seven years old, right? So this, this exists in America. Um, and sometimes I kind of laugh at myself that I even look at the women's club movement because they were very elitist, very elitist, and they only accepted whites and Christians. So they actually integrated uh, racially before they integrated religiously. And I, I, I mentioned my working class background because I think, yeah, my ancestors wouldn't have even, even been fit to clean house for these women. Meanwhile, I'm revering all this great stuff they did. They were amazing women, they were intellectual women, but it was a very elitist social strata that they were part of. And as the African American Women's Club movement started up, that was also an elite within the African American community. And they would actually talk about education as a way to weed out those embarrassing, you know, lower class tendencies of African Americans after the era of slavery, okay? So it's, you know, that, I don't know how to diversify. Um, some people like Marietta Kais, uh, her, her family pronounced it Kais. Uh, they actually changed the spelling so it would be pronounced like rhymes with pies, you know, food you eat. Um, I, I, for two years, thought it was Keys, but they, they don't use the German pronunciation. She was from a very working class family, um, but that's pretty unusual because you couldn't get the education, you couldn't move up very easily in the 19th century. Um, social welfare is another area women worked in. Um, Dorothea Dix started prison reform and uh, asylum reform for mentally ill people. Um, we had you know, Jane Addams people have heard of. There are a lot of women getting involved in reform movements and political activism primarily for women's rights. And then the various areas of social reform, social and political reform that I wanted to list specifically, but you can read, so I don't need to um, go into that too much. Uh, at the bottom, I have the asterisk near advocacy for minorities and immigrants, and that's because uh, when you look at, I wanted to make sure to make that asterisk to make sure to, to tell you that if we want to include more diversity culturally, I actually have gone, um, when I think about who counts as a philosopher, Usually we go for, well, who read Hegel or Kant? Who discussed this? Who translated this? Who, who wrote on the same issues? Who, who dealt with epistemology? If you want to diversify culturally, you have to wait until the 20th century to get women of color in. Mm -hmm. So I did work, I brought in Fanny Coffin, who uh, talked about her pedagogical method and also had a model school for African Americans in Philadelphia. And I theorized about her work because she didn't. She just didn't. She was born a slave. She opened her book with, thank you to my aunt. I can barely say this without getting misty-eyed. Mm -hmm. Thank you to my aunt, and she names her, for managing to save $125 to buy my freedom, only earning $5 a week. And how can you not, how can you not recognize the achievement of this woman born in 1837 who ended up just at the age of 10 or 12 being freed from slavery and being able to educate hundreds and hundreds of African Americans in Philadelphia, which had a strong Quaker tradition which open, was open to her. So, um, so I just say, you know what? I'm forgetting some of these boundaries. In order to include women of color, I'm gonna theorize about their work and um, that's what I'm gonna do. People say that's not philosophy, that's intellectual history and I'll say, Fine. 
<laughs> if that's what it takes, it will be, call me intellectual historian instead, that's fine. Okay, um, now we get to what most people consider philosophy, okay? So we have in America, you may be familiar with and have heard of, um, the transcendentalist. Heard of the transcendentalist? Yeah, okay. People like Emerson, Thoreau, Nathaniel Hawthorne, the author, um, Elizabeth Peabody, Mary um, Margaret Fuller, those are all transcendentalists. Their main influences were German literature and Eastern religions, especially with Emerson. He was very interested in Eastern religions. And because, I'll jump down to the bottom, they were tied to the Unitarian movement, the religious movement. Uh, he actually influenced Unitarianism through his interest in Eastern religions. So they were very much into the rational, in, interestingly enough, they were interested in spiritual unity for all humankind, but they had a very humanist understanding of selfhood, that there is this unitary self that can be identified and identifiable and separate from other. Um, and in that sense, they were really into rationality and developing selfhood in, in that sense. But they also had kind of, uh, some of their literature is very flowery and spiritual. It's a really interesting mix. And they're actually called transcendentalists as kind of a joke because they didn't think they actually, uh, critics of them didn't think they got German philosophy right. So they were called transcendentalists and it stuck. Um, and uh, so it's self-transcendence, unity of humankind, and reverence for nature were uh, three areas that they were very involved in. I actually discovered, I'm crazy into family history, and I discovered my third great-grandfather was uh, Henry David Thoreau's guide through the Maine woods in 1846, <laughs> which I thought, oh my gosh, I wish I could go back in time. Nobody in the family ever talked about it. It was something my sister discovered by doing research. Um, but they had a reverence for nature as part of their um, ideology as well, and they were open to feminism. Uh, Margaret Fuller very much asserted herself as a feminist and established herself as a feminist and was unapologetic about it. Um, Elizabeth Peabody was kind of more, um, more feminist in behavior than she was in theory. And Julia Ward Howe was another woman who was very much a feminist, unapologetic, and she got very involved in the women's rights movement and the peace movement. Um, Margaret Fuller unfortunately died um, in a shipwreck uh, when she was 40. But uh, Julia Ward Howe and Elizabeth Peabody lived a long time, nice full lives. And Julia Ward Howe um, also suggested that Women's Day should be a Women's Day for Peace. That was their first proposal in 1870, that we needed a Women's Peace Day. And uh, then it took 30 years for it to become established in the US, and now it's celebrated many places around the world. OK, so transcendentalism is one area. Then the, transcendentalism really did start in the 1840s. The next branch, idealism, started in the 1860s. Okay, that was in St. Louis, Missouri, again on the Mississippi River, and its influences were German idealism, somewhat the literature, but really they were into their Hegel, Fichte, Schelling, uh, the education of um, Rosencrantz and Froebel, and they really wanted to establish um, a new way of looking at German idealism, bring it to the U.S. because they thought it was really interesting, inspiring, and um, systematic. And they wanted to bring it to the US and translate Hegel. They actually used that terminology in one of their, um, one of their um, St. Louis Philosophical Circle meetings. And um, then they also really, really focused, especially the women, on pedagogy. Now the male leaders of that movement really empowered women. Um, William Torrey Harris seems to have been extremely egalitarian. He published women. He uh, encouraged them to come to the St. Louis Philosophical Society meetings, although women never had official membership, which is very strange. Um, so he encouraged them to translate articles, publish articles. Uh, Susan Blow, he supposedly surprised by publishing her book. Susan Blow was very locked into uh, a, a false, what I call a false humility, uh, very feminine. Oh, I can't. Oh, I don't know enough. Oh, not me. Oh, heavens. <laughs> you know. um, but meanwhile, she gave him a whole manuscript thinking, supposedly not knowing he would go and publish it for her. And then when he did, it was a huge hit, and she was the expert in early childhood education and was one of the most prominent women in the St. Louis circle, um, and in the country, really. But she all the while said, oh, heavens no, I can't be important, not me. But she was an upper-class woman, 
whose father wouldn't let her hold a teaching job because it would have been a mark of shame on him. He was a rich man and she had to volunteer her time, which she did. So it was like philanthropy for her, not work. Um, so their central ideas are that philosophy can and should address social issues, um, that education is both for self-development and unity, and social unity. And they actually um, had this very, uh, the, this very committed way of talking always in German terms. They would talk about the unfolding of the self, Entfaltung, I believe is the, um, Entwilken and Entfaltung were two words that they would use a lot in relation to their, their philosophy of education. And they also would talk about um, self-activity. Substatikeit or statikeit is the German word for it. And they translate it quite literally um, as self-activity. And so they wanted religion, I mean education, to be that, that way that people did self-discovery and self-development and asserting self into the world. And they saw the school as a transitional place between home and civil society for males and females, very egalitarian. It's really interesting. Um, and then the social unity part is where some of them lean more conservative. Susan Blow leaned more conservative, that education was partly for conformity, but William Torrey Harris did even more. He actually was a big proponent of early childhood education because he thought, well, you can't keep farm kids and factory kids in school after the age of 10 because that's when they actually become useful to the family, you know, to earn wages or to help bring in the crops. So let's get them in earlier because these kids are pretty rough around the edges. They need to be refined and socialized because you don't want them to be too idiosyncratic, right? So in that sense, he was very conservative. In most senses, he wasn't, and it's, it's very tempting to put our modern categories on these past people, but I really try to be careful about that because I've read things where people really condemn William Tory Harris for this. Oh, he only cared about conformity. No, no, he was, no. <laughs> it, it, that's a really modern view, and it's not fair to him in his context. And then philosophy in and public life, that we can not only apply it to social problems, but we can actually use it interpersonally and um, take it into the future as we use it in public life. And again, they were very open to feminism. About half the women in the St. Louis movement were feminist, and then the St. Louis movement expanded to other parts of the country, and, um, and about half of them weren't at all. Susan Blow adamantly believed women should stay in early childhood education or the home. She said going into the, quote, industrial realm is damaging for women. It will taint their moral nature. She really thought it was a big mistake. Okay, then we have the pragmatist. The pragmatist, you're familiar with Jane Addams. Okay, this is another area in which women were welcomed and active and involved and helped shape all three of these areas where women helped shape the school of thought. So we've talked a bit about, you know, the concise terms of women in philosophy. And the more I think about it, the more I think the exclusion of women is part of the problem with philosophy that some of the branches of philosophy that we now consider sort of secondary or even stepchildren, you know, philosophy of education, philosophy of religion, women were in those areas. And suddenly they become not philosophy anymore. Of course, they developed pedagogy and educational theories on their own and became powerhouses within those theories. You know, who hasn't heard of Montessori, right? I mean, she was she was one pe person who established her whole own theory of education and it's followed worldwide now. But at the same time, we don't consider that part of philosophy, at least in the US. I think maybe Europe's a bit different in that way, but in the US we get that a lot. It's very frustrating. Uh, the main influences in pragmatism were neo-idealism and uh, <laughs> philosophy of education was a huge part of pragmatism, especially as women were concerned. And their central ideas, again, philosophy can and should uh, address social problems, that action can inform our thought. And that's a really interesting thing, too, because we generally think of philosophy as, like uh, Elizabeth Minich had sort of suggested in her talk last night, it's all in our own little head, all in our own little room, closed off, and we don't think about the outside world that will taint our ideas, that will distort them, they will be pure, right? Um, Pragmatism really turned it on its head and said, no, actually, if I go out into the world, and Jane Adams did this with Hell House, if I go out into the world and I find out what people's problems are, 
I can actually theorize about them and address them more effectively. And she actually turned that into, I'm not just going out in the world, I am living in this world. Uh, Denton Snyder, one of the St. Louis circle, lived at Hell House for a period of time. And he found it really interesting how committed people were to empowering the people they worked with rather than trying to diagnose their problems. Like, what do you, you, you know, you're Russians, you can, you can only work as a housekeeper right now, but you were a teacher there, you know, because your language skills aren't good enough. A lot of the people they worked with were Russian Jews or um, Eastern European and Greek and Italian. Um, and they would say, you know, you have your own expertise. It's a constructivist theory of education. You come to me with a whole package of experiences that are valid and you know yourself and you know your community. So let's talk about what you need. So they would actually hold salons and literary circles as part of what they did. But of course they would help with health and education and um, medical care and, um, and food, just plain food. Uh, then Snyder said one mistake they made was they uh, wanted to deliver coal as volunteers to needy families that couldn't afford to buy or just deliver it anyway because it was laborious work. But that took jobs away from the immigrant communities that needed it. So one time Denton Snyder was going to deliver the coal and he ran into one of the young men he used to see. He said, oh, what are you doing? He said, oh, well, I don't have work <laughs> because I used to deliver coal. So they stopped that kind of thing. They were like, oh, we can't do too much because that will end up eroding the, the options they have to be active in the world. And um, then the famous way of looking at truth by mostly William James and John Dewey, but um, actually in the other order, um, but it's, it's part of pragmatism through and through, is that truth is what gets results or what works, okay? And um, that is interesting because in some ways it's kind of classically capitalistic, right? I mean, James actually used the word cash value, right, as a metaphor. But that sounds way too capitalistic. I didn't use that terminology. Um, so in, a sem in some sense, it's so consequentialist, it's a little hard for us to stomach as philosophers who want to be more um, refined you know, and think that you, you have ideas that ha have effect, but you don't want to be that base about it. But that's, that's one way they described it. Um, I should mention that in relation to war and peace, and I'm sure this will come up when we talk about on the women this week with Mary Ellen, that Jane Addams used the term moral equivalence of war. And uh, William James gets more credit for it, but it does seem like she actually used that first in the lecture. So you, you think about what works in that sense. You want to look at what is morally good in the world that has as much weight and importance as the way we talk about war so reverentially, you're willing to die, sacrifice your life. Well, what about fire people? Right? What about nurses and doctors who are going into disease-ridden areas to try to help people? And that was their moral equivalence of war. So that's kind of a different take on the, on the what works question that I do think they're related, however. Okay. Then the last, yeah, this is just about right. Mary Ellen actually has some women to present to show us. So I just want to go into ac entering academia we had women, 20 women PhDs in philosophy. There were 200 women PhDs in any field in the 19th century. I ran into this really wonderful list created in the 1950s that had a list of all the women that they could find who did any PhDs in the country. So that's where I get this. Um, their areas of focus tended to be idealism, ethics, philosophy of his, uh, ph history of philosophy, or social and political philosophy. 14 of the 20 women had academic careers, but the vast majority in women's colleges only. Only three PhDs worked outside of women's colleges, co-educational, we call them, men's and women's colleges. And I did, I did intend a different slide and I don't have them synced. There you go, sorry about this. Thank you, Mary Ellen, for your adept noticing of this. Okay, so 14 of the women had academic careers. The majority at women's colleges, only three worked at other than women's colleges. One woman taught at a at a University of Denver, but she didn't have a PhD. Um, so I've only found four total. <clears throat> the most successful women were from Cornell, five of them, Michigan, three of them, Harvard and Radcliffe, two of them, but they weren't granted degrees from Harvard. One had one accepted a Radcliffe degree. Mary Rottencock had said, "Forget it. I won't take it. If they don't give me Harvard, I'm not taking it." 
and John Hopkins, that's Christine Ladd Franklin you may have heard of. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that Cornell and Michigan had the best mentoring. They just, Cornell especially, had the Sage School for Women. They were really committed to the women, bringing them in, getting them fellowships, et cetera. Um, and all those women did well. So I have, as another bullet point, the curious case of women at Yale. Because Yale admitted women, whereas Harvard wouldn't. But the three women who did PhDs there in philosophy did, didn't get anywhere. In psychology, they did. So I have to look more at, was it the mentor? Was it the, literally the human beings they were mentored by and taught by? Or was it just bad luck? Or what? So that's an interesting thing. But the Cornell women all did the very best. Um, and then I thought it would be fun for you to know other fields women got PhDs in that are related, because you are a group of people from European systems which might have different views of this as well. So I thought it could be very interesting for you to know who there are 21 in education, 10 in psychology. I should mention that 20 of the women PhDs in philosophy also started psychology programs at their colleges. So there was a lot of crossover between psych and philosophy at the time, but I kept them separate. 20 here and 10 over here in psych. Uh, political science, five. Economics, five. And religion, two women. Uh, there were a couple of women who did law degrees, um, but the law degree was still being worked out. I haven't included that. Across all fields, 10 to 12 women worked in high schools or went to social work related fields because they couldn't get hired. Um, one of the saddest cases is Eliza Sunderland. After John Dewey left the University of Michigan, she applied twice for two different positions. She literally received a letter back that said, I'm sorry, we don't hire women. I don't think they even said, I'm sorry. Um, but women, women adopted this view too. Uh, Carolyn Sherman, a woman who coordinated the 1893 World's Fair where they had science discussions and philosophy discussions and religion discussions. She was appointed to helping find women because women complained, the feminists complained, why aren't you including women? And in her letter, she said, we need one woman, maybe two, but not more than that because a little woman goes a long way. So she contributed to the problem herself. Um, but yeah, I think that um, Eliza Sutherland was the saddest case because the person they hired didn't even have his PhD yet. I believe it was Charles Ames at that point. Didn't have a PhD yet was about you know 26 or whatever. And she was a woman who had finished her PhD, worked alongside her husband in the Unitarian congregation, um, was extremely well um, established and professional. And so what she ended up doing was continuing to work with her husband in the church and holding informal classes in the history of philosophy and religion and philosophy in the church for college students at the University of Michigan which is, you know, their church is right beside the campus. That's, that's what she did. She still needed to do what she wanted, the passion she had for philosophy and philosophy of religion, but she was relegated to doing it in this different context. So thus ends my slide presentation. And uh, I'm open to questions now. Mary Ellen, you're mm -hmm. going to get your machine, or is it all set? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll take. Are we proceed? Is somebody helping uh, just wait right. to uh, bring her slides online? Yeah, and we I can, can take questions. Yeah. yeah, a few questions and give Marilyn at least. Yes. So yes. Uh, thanks very much. I, I was wondering, um, given the large amount of immigration that came to the United States towards the end of the 19th century, whether you looked at Yeah, I haven't looked that much at her. I've heard of her, but I haven't looked at her yet. But there are people like Emma Goldman yeah. is a great example. Um, uh, there are other people. I don't know if Mary Ellen maybe has them on the list. Some of them stayed in Europe, though. Um, yeah, I'm trying to look at... Uh, right now I'm looking at diversity from the U.S. I haven't really done immigration, immigrant women yet. But the, the large waves of immigration, a lot of them weren't writing in English yet. You know, the ones, the people who came. It's similar to, uh, for instance, in the second volume I'm working on is the academic women. 
in order to include women of color, I have to take women who got PhDs into the 1920s because no African-American woman got a PhD before 1920. Oh, well, no, Sarah, Sarah um, Anna Julia Cooper got uh, a PhD in the early teens, I believe it was. But yeah, that's something I should, I should look at. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>